Hey, what's going on guys? So happy you tuned in with us for this Wednesday night experience. We're in a series called Into the Wild and today we are in part two of that series talking about uh, this idea of wilderness, this idea of walking through the wilderness, trials, tribulations, how we handle the wilderness, what its purpose is, why we're uh, often led into the wilderness um, and how God can use it as a powerful tool to shape us um, and to prune us and to make us better. And so I want to jump in today <clears throat> with this idea of waiting in the wilderness. That's the title of the message tonight, just waiting in the wilderness. And it's really not easy to wait. I've struggled with waiting and with impatience for most of my life, uh, wanting things immediately. Maybe you're the same way as me. I mean, we've grown up really as a society, uh, millennials, Generation Z like you guys, We've grown up in this like Amazon Prime, two day delivery, one minute microwavable generation where everything is easily streamed. It's, it's at our fingertips. It's everything is, uh, all technology really is about trying to get faster, trying to get better, trying to get more effective. And so everything about our society uh, caters towards impatience, towards having a hard time with waiting. But we so don't serve a microwavable, programmable, uh, fast, get it now God. We serve a God that values process and values development. And we serve a God that values these things. And so I want to take a look in scripture uh, at first Samuel, where God speaks to Samuel, who was a, a prophet of God, someone who uh, heard God and spoke on God's behalf to the nation of Israel. And he was someone that God often spoke through. And so uh, he's giving new direction. God's giving Samuel new direction on who would be king over all of Israel. And so turn with me, if you would, to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1 through 13. It says this, it says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, You have mourned long enough for Saul, who was the previous king. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel asked, How can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he's going to kill me. He said, take a cow with you, take a heifer with you, the Lord replied, and say that you've come to make a sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice, uh, to the sacrifice and I will show you which one of his sons to anoint. So he does that, and as uh, the story goes on, he, he shows up, and they're worried. They're like, oh my gosh, the prophet of God's here. Like, is he coming to judge us? Like, do you come in peace? And he's like, yeah, I come in peace. I'm here uh, just to, to see your sons. And so uh, he, he goes and, and gets he has him pull forward all of his kids, and so he pulls it, his first son, and, and it says in the Bible that Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this guy is the Lord's anointed. He's, he's probably strong and handsome. He's like, man, this is the Lord's guy this is the anointed but the lord said to samuel in verse 7 he said the lord said don't judge by his appearance or by his height for i have rejected him the lord doesn't see things the way that you see them people judge by outward appearance but the lord looks at the heart then jesse told his son abinadab to step forward and walk in front of samuel but samuel said this is not the one the lord has chosen so he continues with all of these sons, and, and the Lord had not chosen any of them. Then Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? He's like, bro, come on. Like, is this, like, God sent me here. Come on. Is this really all of your sons? And so Jesse goes, well, they're still the youngest. They're, they're still David. He's, he's just out in the field. He's just a shepherd boy, though. He's just taking care of sheep way out in the fields. But he, he was told by the prophet, send for him at once. I'm not going to sit down until David arrives. And so he sends for him and, and here comes David. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes, the Bible says. And the Lord says, this is the one, anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, the ones that had been passed over, the ones that, that, that really they thought were going to be <laughs> the kings, they thought they were the anointed, or at least Samuel did. And so he's there among his brothers, and I love this. The one who was forgotten, the one who was in the fields, gets anointed in front of them. And Samuel took that flask of olive oil, and he anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. And then Samuel returned to Ramah. You see, David wasn't, he, <laughs> David wasn't anything special. David was a shepherd boy out in the field. He, he wasn't found, the anointed one that God had chosen this young boy was not found where you would have thought. He wasn't on the battlefield already accomplishing these great conquests. He, he wasn't like in this place of honor waiting with some political power. He was just a shepherd in a field waiting in the wilderness, waiting 
in the wilderness. He was just a young boy being faithful to the task that had been set in front of him, faithful to the task that was put before him. He was building a history with God out in the fields. And because of that, God was planning to make history through him and through his life and through his lineage. And so the Bible tells us that God doesn't look at the outward appearance, but rather he looks at the heart. God knows that the outside can be deceiving. He knows that things can look good on the outside, but be in ruins on the inside. You see, God doesn't look at the leaves of the tree. He looks at the roots. He doesn't look at the outside. He looks what's going on inside. And I'm not a botanist. I'm not a a gardener by any means at all. (coughs) Neither is my wife. But I was doing some research on roots and on root systems and plants for another message that I've done in the past. And and I stumbled upon this disease that trees can get called uh, phytophora, which is a fungal disease that kind of stealthily attacks the root systems of trees. And so what can happen is the above ground systems can remain intact while the root system is really um, being destroyed by this fungal disease. And so on the outside, it can actually have the appearance of health. It can look good, but on the inside, in the roots where it matters, where the, where the nutrients are absorbed, they can actually begin to be destroyed. And oftentimes by the time that you absolutely can see the damage that's been caused on the outside, it's already too late. The root systems have already 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 have irreparable damage. They're they're just destroyed by the time that you can see it on the outside. So you can have a fruitful season, but if you don't have healthy roots, if you don't have healthy roots, it doesn't matter. You see, it's in John 15, 16, it said that Jesus is looking for lasting fruit. He wants us to bear lasting fruit, fruit that lasts. He wants our impact to be more than just seasonal. He wants us to keep making a difference in every season of our lives, to keep serving, to keep growing, to to keep building these root systems and, and having this waiting time. He doesn't want us just to look fruitful on the outside. He wants us to actually be fruitful on the inside. He wants us to have a, a healthy root system. He wants us to continue to be able to bless people. He doesn't want us to have that crash moment where all of a sudden all our leaves fall off and the fruit falls off the tree and, and we're, we're at this place where we can't grow anymore because we weren't rooted in a relationship with him. So while you're waiting in the wilderness, while you're in this waiting season, I want to encourage you guys, grow, grow, build deep roots with God. Remember, God looks at who you are without the mask on. He looks at the real you. He anoints the real you. He uses the real you. And he wants to see roots. That's really what he's looking for. You see, David, without even knowing it, he had been preparing his heart and building roots out in the pastures, out in the middle of the wilderness. And this is really important for us to note because I think God has some principles here for us in this scripture. And I think if we look at David in the pasture, in the wilderness, uh, we can find something that we can really use. The first thing that I saw is oftentimes it's in the place of isolation that we receive the greatest revelation. Again, it's the place of isolation that we can receive the greatest revelation. The word uh, isolate in the dictionary is defined as a place, uh, isolate is defined as to set or place apart, to set apart, to be alone. And so in other words, if we choose to separate ourselves from the world, from these distractions, we shut them out and we just get alone with God. We just like David out in these pastures, we we look at this moment of saying, all right, I'm going to get alone with Jesus. I'm going to isolate myself from everything else and just be with Jesus. I really believe that's when God speaks most clearly. I mean, when you think about like the Beats headphones or the new Apple, uh, uh, the AirPods Pro, what's so awesome about them? The noise canceling technology. Like that's the coolest part about the Beats. It's coolest part about the AirPods Pro is that they have this noise canceling technology. So it actually makes the music clearer. It makes everything else around you, all the distractions, all the other side noises that would normally take your attention or detract from the experience of the music in your ears, all of a sudden this noise canceling technology cancels that stuff out so you can focus in on this sound. And I really believe that that's what we need to do with God. We need to cut out the distractions. We have to cut out the things that are that are keeping us from focusing in on the voice of the Lord. And thankfully, coronavirus has kind of done that for us. It cut out a lot of the busyness of our lives. A lot of the distractions that we've previously had have been removed from us. And now we can focus on God. You might have to pause Netflix. You might have to take a break from scrolling on Instagram or TikTok for a little while. But if you can do that, if you can cut those distractions out, man, God can speak so clearly in this season. I really believe it's in the secret place, the quiet place that God has incredible 
incredible things hidden for you. The wilderness can be a powerful place to meet God. We look at Moses and Elijah and Joshua and John the Baptist, even Jesus had powerful times with God in the middle of the wilderness, in the middle of the quiet, the middle of these places that are abandoned when they were isolated with just no one else but them and God. You know, books, song ideas, strategies to impact your community, your schools, new levels of faith, all kinds of things can be found in these seasons if we're tuned in, if we're listening, if we're looking for them. And I know it can be frustrating as a youth or as a young adult thinking like, man, why does God have to hide stuff though? Like, why do I have to go to this, this wilderness, this isolated place, this alone place and, and search for these things and, and search his heart? Here's the deal. I know it's frustrating. There's, you just want God to be like, God, can't life just be easier? Like, can't relationships be easier? Can't you just give these things to me now? Why do I have to search for them? I know because I've been there before. I've asked those same questions. But remember in Proverbs 25 verse 2, it says, It's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the glory of kings to search a matter out. So I remember a pastor saying for me to me one time, God doesn't hide things from us. God hides things from us. For us. And so this isn't like when your mom used to like hide the cookies from you so you wouldn't go sneak more cookies and it was like in some place you couldn't reach, right? This is like, uh, it's more like Easter, which is coming up this Sunday, right? It's like Easter. It's like they're, they're, God takes these little nuggets and he wraps them up and he's, it's, it's intentional and he hides them because he knows when you find them, there's going to be great joy that you're going to experience when you find these Easter eggs, when you find these nuggets that God has hidden for you in the secret place with him. It's, it's a plan. It's not hiding from from you it's hiding for you to bless you for the excitement for the joy that you'll experience when you find them it's amazing and the second thing is this it's if you are rooted in the pasture you will not wither in the palace in other words if your foundation is built on a relationship with Jesus if it's built on prayer if it's built on worship you're not gonna have to worry when God begins to expand your influence and your platform because when you exit the wilderness when you move from the pasture to the palace if you have a strong foundation a strong root system built you're not going to have to worry that the pressure uh, and the winds and the storms and the things you're going to face in the next season, they will not shake you because of the root system, because of the foundation that you built in the previous season. I mean, if you've ever played Jenga, you know you start at the top, right? Because if you start at the foundation, if you tear apart somebody's foundation, if you can break up that bottom of Jenga, it's going to topple, it's going to fall. And, and that's what the devil's goal is in these wilderness seasons, is to get you to not go to Jesus, to not build roots. He doesn't want you to, to turn to him in these times. He doesn't want you to learn in the wilderness because if he can destroy your foundation, he can destroy your life. It, if his goal really is just to keep you out of relationship with Jesus, out of a place of prayer, far away from worshiping him, because he knows if he can do that, if he can get you to focus more on the dry place you're in than the one who's able to make rivers in the wastelands, if he can get you to focus more on your surroundings than, than who you're surrounded by, then he knows that he can destroy you. You have to have a strong foundation. You have to be rooted in relationships. So David obviously goes on to become king, and we'll look more at that later, but he was only able to lead at the capacity he did because of the season he had of building roots out in the pastures, out in the fields, out in the wilderness. He was faithful in the wilderness over a little, and so God ends up making him a ruler over much. He allowed God to develop his character, the things that he needed to sustain, the anointing, the gifts, the calling, the power that God wanted him to operate in, and that he eventually would release over him. He was able to sustain it because of the roots that he built in the wilderness season. So if we can learn to foster a relationship with Jesus in this secret place, in our own place of prayer, learning from him in the wilderness, just you and him, then you too will have a proper foundation for God to start building your future upon. And it's in this place of prayer, in this place of vulnerability, in this place of intimacy that God gets to do the work that he needs to do to develop your character. Because that's what this is. It's a, it's a pruning process, a refining process. It's a, a little uncomfortable and painful. And it's kind of hard sometimes to invite God into like the nitty gritty places of your heart where, where you know you have stuff you need to work on. But that's powerful and it's worth it. See, too often I think we want to go from the seed to the fruit. We just want to get like, God, give us the seed and with us all of a sudden we want fruit. We want to see things happening. We want, we want the promise and, and we want it now. We don't want to wait uh, for the season of development. But that's the, the thing is that when God plants a seed, when he plants a dream, when he plants something in our hearts, we don't just get to walk into the promise. We don't just walk into the destiny, into the fruit season. It's not how the process 
works. There has to be a hidden season. There has to be a season where we're planted, where we're under the soil, under the dirt, the season where no one knows your name, the season of obscurity, when you feel looked over, where you feel forgotten, when you feel like you're not making a difference. But you may feel like you're not making a difference, but what you're being is developed. And that's the important part. You're being sharpened, you're being prepared. It's in that season when you gain your footing. It's in that season where you're prepared to produce the fruit that's going to come in time. I promise you, it's going to come in time. Just let God prepare you. Let him sharpen you. Let him sharpen your character. Let him grow you. Let him test your integrity. Let that be a season of growing, of learning. If you make a mistake, learn from that mistake. Keep going. God has perfect timing on when to move you from season to season. And if you listen to his voice, if you if you lead um, from a place uh, of, of following the voice of the Holy Spirit, of responding when he speaks, watch as he leads us not only into the wilderness, but God leads us through the wilderness so that we come out on the other side stronger. We come out on the other side better. And the length of that wilderness is up to God. But if we obey him, if we submit to him, if our character is sharpened and our integrity is is found uh, strong in that season, then I promise you that season will end up being shorter than if you focus on the surroundings and you focus on the bad and you focus on the negative. That'll end up stretching your season longer than you were originally intended to be in that season. So my challenge for you students this week is simply this. Find your own place of prayer. Find your isolation spot. So we're already isolated in our homes. Find a spot where you can go in your closet, in your room, in your basement, wherever it might be, and get alone with Jesus. Talk to him, pray with him, ask him, God, what are you trying to teach me in this season? What am I supposed to know? What, what can I be doing, God, to be learning, to be growing through this wilderness season? And if you do that, watch as your roots begin to grow and God begins to do really cool things in your life. Hey, if you're listening right now, I want to give you just a quick opportunity before we close for the night uh, to say yes to Jesus. Maybe you're saying, man, I've never actually chosen to follow Jesus. And if that's you and you've never chosen to say, Jesus, I want you in my life. Like, I want to build a real relationship with you. I want to build roots with you. Then I want to invite you to do that. Just repeat the simple prayer. There's nothing special or magical about this prayer. It's simply a heart declaration. Just say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've lived my own way. But today, I give my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my past. And make me new. God, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. That you rose from the grave. And that now I can have a real relationship with you. Take my life and do with it whatever you want. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, love you guys so much. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, stay tuned for Sunday, uh, Res Church, Easter at home. It's going to be a powerful experience. Invite your friends, invite your family, and we'll see you online this Sunday for Easter at home. Love you guys.